we have okay <laughs> hello yep go ahead oh okay um the first question was have you applied we have but we're denied because we were a farm so do i put yes yes okay yeah. just want to just want to clarify <laughs> You wait a minute. You you applied for the PPP and you were denied because you're a farm. Correct. Uh, several times. Correct. All right. This let's let's circle two. back and spend some time on that at the end. Okay. Okay. And my husband has more um, clarification on that because he talked to more people than I did. But we've been talking together amongst all this. So, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, I have finished the poll, so I'll just jump in and do a brief introduction. Um, obviously, these are crazy times for a lot of different people, and um, the, the federal government has launched the CARES Act to try and address some, you know, stimulus funding to a variety of businesses, and if you have tried to apply, whew, what a crazy thing it's been if you've tried to understand it. As a nonprofit, I have um, pursued the funding and watched, I think, four different webinars when the funds were first released and got four different answers on four different days. Everything seems to be changing very, very fast. Even since we decided to host this webinar, things have changed. But we have Laura with us tonight, who I know from many, many moons ago when I was at the Division of Agriculture and Laura was at the Kenai Peninsula Fair. And we worked, like you mentioned, on a couple of crazy Alaska-grown ideas back then. But Laura has been really taking a deep dive into the CARES Act um, for the last couple of weeks, and she's got a, probably a better understanding of it than any of us. So she's got a, um, a webinar that she's going to walk through with us. I would say if you have questions as you go, please keep your mic muted and throw the question into the chat box. I'll be monitoring the chat box. And if I feel like it's a question that we should interrupt Laura for, I'll do so. If not, we'll get to the questions at the end. And that's why we want to kind of go ahead and get started because we want to honor everyone's time and have that time at the end for Q&A. So without further ado, Laura, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm going to be sharing my screen with you. So once I do that, I'm not really going to be able to see what's going on. I'm just going to be able to see my screen. Well, maybe not. I guess I can. How do I? Technical difficulty. There we go. All right. There. I... All right, you're all going to have to watch the thumbnail. Sorry, I'll drag it down into the corner. So Paycheck Protection Program is this. Is, let's talk about SBA and the three different programs that they have offered. I know there are four, but we're really just going to talk about the three, which is the Paycheck Protection Program, the EIDL, which is the Economic um, Income. I've done the acronym for so long, I don't remember it disaster loan. That, so the Economic Income Disaster Loan, IDL, and the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. We're going to talk about the PPP first, and I'm just going to go forward. And for those of you that aren't familiar, I'm sure at this point everybody's heard it, but we're going to talk about it anyway. It's guaranteed loans for businesses less than 500 employees that have a payroll. So you have to have a W-2 payroll if you're a business. It's forgivable. What that means is it starts out as a loan, but if you spend it the right way, then you're going to get all of that money written off the top of the loan, and you will only owe for the part that you didn't spend properly. And there are some tricks to spending it properly, so we'll cover that. Um, so that is the PPP. What you're going to find is most of you aren't, it's supposed to be this big pie in the sky, and it's really not. So who can apply? Small businesses less than 500 employees, 501c3 nonprofits only, or a 501c19, which is a veterans organization. Any other nonprofit not eligible. Every small business theoretically can apply. They also opened it up for 1099 contractors. So if you are a sole proprietor or you do contract labor and receive 1099s, you are also eligible. Um, I should say right off the bat, right now there is no money left. There are no lenders taking applications, but we're going to talk about it anyway because they're asking for more money, and I want us to be in a position and ready to apply if it comes. So basically went over that again. So what do you need to be eligible? You've got to have proof that you were in business before February 15th. You have to have proof that you have employees on payroll. So that's typically going to be your 940 or your 941. That's going to be your payroll report that you file quarterly with the IRS. 
And then your loan calculation is going to be based on that. You need your tax return. If you don't have 2019, you're going to need your profit and loss statement for 2019. So I'm going to pop this open. And so it's going to jump out of here. And I've never done that before. So here we go. This is a really neat resource that we found. And I'm going to have it available for you guys. Um, it talks about the stimulus. And we're not going to go into that at all. But the economic impact, I'll go back to. But the PPP is the part that I want to talk about right here. And that is how you calculate it. So the payout or loan amount is calculated by taking an average payroll. And there are two different snapshots. Actually, there are three allowable snapshots. The first one is to take your annual income or your annual payroll. So say your payroll was $100,000. You're going to take that and you're going to divide it by 12 and then you're going to multiply it by two and a half times. And I should know that number off the top of my head. I've done this enough, but I don't. But it's going to make you eligible for roughly $25,000. And then you have to apply for it. You go through this lovely process. And then when you get it, you have eight weeks to spend it exactly the way they say that you, you are supposed to spend it, which is 75% on payroll, 25% on allowable operation costs. So they've got a couple scenarios in here that we can look at on how to calculate that. But this is going to be in the resource guide that we're going to get you at the end. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those examples, but definitely go find this later. And I'm going to bounce back over to my next slide. So the bank's going to give you a worksheet to do. And in that worksheet, it's going to ask you how many full-time employees you have. So if you've got six part-time employees, that's three full-time. Or if you have six part-time, but two or three-quarter time and two or half time, you're going to do the math and that's going to give you three and a half employees or four and a half employees. So the, the number of full-time employees you have is important. Round up don't round down. So then again, you're going to plug in the total salaries. Salaries are going to be, if you have somebody that just gets a flat $20,000 a year for working for you or $2,000 a month, you're going to plug that in. In a lot of ways, that might be you as the farmer. And we'll talk about how to document that in a little bit. And then you've got your wages. That's going to be W-2 wages. 1099s do not count for this program. But what does count is if you do have any health care plans, if you do pay, if they can earn vacation or sick pay, that is calculated in. And then down here at the bottom, this is an example of that sole proprietor income. So either you get a 1099 that says you make $28,000 a year, or your Schedule C shows your gross profit at $28,000. That's your magic number. And these are all going with the annual numbers. And then you plug it all in and it does the math for you. And if this was your business, you would actually have $31,000 that is eligible for the PPP. With that, how do you spend it? You're going to come down and these numbers don't match. They're just, don't expect it to flow. These are just samples. So you're going to come back and you're going to spend it on payroll. 75% of your loan has got to go into this figure right here and you have to spend it on payroll. You can't spend it on anything else. If you do, then you're not going to get it forgiven. And the rest can be broken down into utilities and rent and interest on any loans that you have on the business. Have we got any questions yet, Amy? Nope, we're doing good. Okay, then I'm going to keep going. This is the application that is on the SBA website. You can go and again, it's in the resources and print that out and fill it out. Have it 100% ready. Each lender has their own variation of this form, but they're going to ask all of these same core questions. And so again, if they open up that funding, you will have it and you will be ready to go. Um, where it gets tricky is if you are an S Corp or a C Corp versus a sole proprietor or an LLC, 
you pay yourself differently when you are in those scenarios. And so you're going to want to get some advice from your accountant and ask them what number to use. Different lenders are tricky. Um, some lenders are saying, okay, great, we're taking it on face value. You write it, you say it's there, it becomes a loan if you're wrong. So we're going to grant it to you. Other lenders, like the one we used for our PPP, look at it, scrutinize my 60 page packet. It was 60 pages, guys. And they cut it in half because they decided I was a seasonal business and they didn't like it. So um, don't just assume that because you came up with a figure that it's gonna be right. Be picky about the lender that you use. You have to use a lender that you have a business relationship with. That means you have to already have a bank account with them and it can't be a personal one, it's gotta be a business account. Um, Alaska USA is doing PPP loans and they've got a great program, Northern Bank as well, but you have to have already had a business account with them before February 15th. So you're going to be stuck going to your bank unless they don't do that and then you're going to have to contact the SBA and you're going to have to ask them how to go about this. So what's forgiven? Payroll. Any payroll that you pay between February 15th and June 30th is forgiven against this loan. But what they require is that this eight week window, so say you get your loan funded and they're starting to fund now, by May 1st and June 30th in that eight week window, you have to have spent all of this money the way it was meant to be spent. If you do not, it becomes a 1% interest loan due in two years. Like I said, you can spend 25% on rent or utilities or mortgages. But as you can see, when we have our payroll, and you're, you guys are probably mostly seasonal as I am, it's not going to really put a dent in our payroll. Yes, Amy? Listen to it. Turn it up. Oh. No, I think somebody doesn't have their, um, their uh, mic muted. Yep, mute their mic, please. All right, so again, finding a lender. There is a website and you can go. I pulled the 10 most active SBA lenders because when I first made this lovely presentation, you could just pick a lender and they could take you. Um, very quickly, lenders realized that they didn't want just anybody. They wanted to um, work with their customers first. And so our choices narrowed. QuickBooks is going to be able to take these loans. So if you do your payroll with QuickBooks, that is an opportunity for you. Um, and a uh, couple others, Cabbage, and I don't know, I'm not familiar with Cabbage, but they've gotten approved too, and they'll be an opportunity for somebody who doesn't have an existing relationship. So that's the PPP. Any questions about that before we move on to the idol? No questions yet in the chat box, Laura. Awesome. Am I going? Right pace, am I going too fast? Most people have their screens turned off, but I, I think okay. you're doing great. Okay, awesome, thanks. So we're gonna talk about the idle, the economic injury disaster loan. And even though agriculture businesses are not eligible, that's the very first thing that it says when you're asking questions, it still bears discussing because they talked about there being this $10,000 advance and it was free money to everyone that applied. And that's not the case. It was an advance of $1,000 per full-time employee if you're eligible. And again, it's out of money, but it may come back funded. And for those of you that have cottage industries, so, um, you raise bees, it's not going to be eligible for taking care of the bees, but it would be eligible to help with the impact of selling bees, beeswax candles. Or if you have a byproduct that you're selling, typically, at, and um, Brad, when you talk about farmers markets, kind of touch on those a little bit more and let's flush that out a little bit. But it is an opportunity, but it's not a great one. Um, it was supposed to be this, you applied, it was quick, you immediately got $10,000 and it became a 3.75% fixed interest rate and everything's golden. Well, they changed the rules so fast that it made our heads spin and it boiled down to up to $10,000, $1,000 per employee 
and whatever money they advance you on the idle, they're going to deduct from what you can write off on your PPP. So they combined the two loans and made them not reciprocal, but they he, they created a, a relationship between the two that I'll explain a little better. It is a 3.75% fixed rate, so that is a great opportunity for us to buy our way out of this um, pandemic, as opposed to just taking a handout, which long term will probably save our country, but it was not what they sold us. They sold us free money, and it was a boil of goods. So, um, clarifications for the application. They're going to ask for your gross revenues. They want to know tw 12 months prior to the date of the disaster. So, it's not actually your entire P&L from 2019. They want, for whatever reason, January to January. They want to know your cost of goods sold. And if you're a nonprofit, they want to know your operation costs. So remember when I said earlier that the two, um, the PPP and the idle go hand in hand. So if you were to get $10,000 from the idle advance, because you had 10 employees, and then you got the PPP loan for $28,000, they're going to forgive $28,000, but they're only going to pay you $18,000. But you're going to have to document to them that you had $28,000 worth of expenditures within the correct criteria. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with a loan that's due and payable in 24 months. And we can go back and talk about that a little more if there are some of you that need to talk about that. Laura, we have had a couple of questions yeah, come in. let's go. Okay, so Colleen questioned, um, I was told I needed to have a separate business license to sell my value added farm products and couldn't apply if I sold under my farm license. A separate business license if I wanted to get idle for value added products and my business would be sales. That is correct. Do you have, are you running everything as a sole proprietor, Colleen, under one um, EIN or do you have more than one? Yes, sole proprietor, and I'm the only worker. Yeah, that's where we, because we were streamlining it, it, yeah, you, they can't differentiate between the two products. If you could come up with a profit and loss statement that was strictly for the cottage industry items, you might be able to find a lender, or you might be able to argue it, but the SBA really doesn't have a gatekeeper for differentiating. They want two separate EIN numbers to keep it separate. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I did um, get another business license, but it wasn't until April and they wanted right. to spend it in February. And by the way, everybody can get free business licenses now for two years. So that's right. thing. Yeah. And, and that is one of the things I think a lot of us realize is that we should have been paying ourselves W-2s. We should have had that separate business license. Even if we didn't have a separate EIN, that business license helps us establish the validity of what we're doing. So for the next pandemic, we're really going to be ready. I'm sorry. I'm being <laughs> facetious. But <laughs> second, second question, Laura. Yes. Um, this is from Patty. I understood to pay myself I had I had have to have reflected in my tax statement from last year. Second, my employees don't start till July. How do I disperse it before they work? So, um, Patty, I am not sure that you will have an eight week window from the time funds are dispersed. So when you applied for that loan, you needed to clarify that you don't start until July. So when you go to accept that loan, do not let that money hit your bank account before July 1st. That is your marker. And hopefully your lender will work with you. Some lenders are not being flexible with that and they're trying to get it delivered May 1st because SBA gave them 20 days from the time they took your application to the time they're supposed to fund it. They're not understanding the needs of seasonals at all. And what was the first part of her question? I understood to pay myself. I had to have that reflected in my tax statement from last year. So I think she's talking about her income as the farmer, like you mentioned. Yes. And that would have been that 
if you sometimes it's W two, but it, it could also count as your profit on your Schedule C. So if your Schedule C showed a profit, that is technically your payment. They will accept it as that. Don't let your banker tell you otherwise. SBA accepts that. A lot of the bankers don't like it. We're good. Okay. At the end of the EID, in case you did apply for it, there's this last little screen that has a number. And it's um, really important that you write it down. Um, I did not, and they have no way of looking me up based on my social security number, which seems really odd to me. Everyone else in the world can, but they want that number. And really right now, if you call for status, they're saying, sorry, wait for the money to show up in your bank account. Somebody will be in touch. Um, they are trying to set up a system where they can actually keep track of what's going on, but they're overwhelmed. It's beyond anything they've ever tried to do, and they really... For as quickly as this is rolled out and all the hiccups, I'm still pretty impressed. Um, so that's the PPP and the EIDL and the SBA options. There is one, two other pieces of the CARES Act that, if, that go through the SBA and they were, are worth mentioning. One is the express bridge loan. And an express bridge loan is a quick $25,000. They say quick, I'm assuming you can see my finger quotes. Um, that's supposed to help stop, do the stopgap. Finding a lender in Alaska that actually does those express loans, I haven't found one that says yes to that. Um, but it has to be a lender you've already had a relationship with again, just like the PPP. And I think there are only like five or six that actually do them with the SBA. There's a whole list that says they do, but when you call them, they say, oh no, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't do those. So the bridge loans are out there. They keep being spoken about, but I've yet to find anybody able to actually apply for one. And that money is an advance on your EIDL loan. So you have to be eligible for the EIDL to get the express bridge loan. And then there's this huge 300 page document that's all about the tax credits. So if you were eligible for the PPP, and you did not apply for it or you did not get it, there is the potential of getting a $5,000 per employee tax credit up to $10,000. And that's something your CPA is going to have to help you with. And that's as far as I'll touch on it because I don't want to be held liable <laughs> for not knowing it well enough. There is some good news. Do we have any more questions on SBA stuff before I, I tap a little bit into this uh, USDA stuff? Yeah, Patty had a follow up. She said, so I had more expenses than profit last year. What then? And Alaska has later seasons than other farmers. How does PPP help us in this later seasons? So unfortunately, the PPP wasn't designed to look at our late seasons. And I've spoken with Senator Sullivan and Senator Murkowski's office um, at length. They are trying to find a phase four correction for our later seasons. I think it's gonna be something after the fact that we're gonna to have to be showing them the difference between last year to this year and asking for support on the other side. I don't know that they can roll it out fast enough. Um, secondarily, if you took a loss last year, there's really nothing that can be done to help you. And it's, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't make the program. <laughs> I'm just sharing how it works. And uh, yeah, and there are a lot of businesses that are in that boat. It's again, you take all the write-offs and sometimes it's gonna not help you in the long run. Good to go, thanks, Laura. Awesome. So the other part of the CARES Act does allocate $9.5 billion to the USDA. Um, they have to spend the $9.5 billion to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus by providing support. Um, there are several things to note. $9.5 million must provide support for ag producers and likely means the money will go to the producers themselves. Remember that likely. Um, second, the producers must have specialty crops. So they've got to have local food systems, including farmers markets, restaurants, and schools, or livestock producers, including dairy producers. 
So the USDA is still trying to get a hold of what they're supposed to do with their money. And I think Amy Seitz is going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, yeah, Amy, I don't think, I think I, I mainly put this stuff in here for information because we found it. This is not my expertise. I am your SBA girl. So, Amy, if you want to talk a little bit about USDA or if anybody has any more questions, we could do that. I did want to include the Farmer Relief Fund. The American Farmland Trust does have $1,000 per farmer that they are willing to help with until the money runs out. They're also taking donations on the other side. But these are the parameters of who's eligible. There's a link to the application here. And then at the, at the end of this, I have a resource page that I'm gonna share with you guys as a handout so that you can go back and look at any of this and that application will be in there as well. And then there's that resource page. And I believe um, I can share it. So I will figure that out in um, a minute when I get back in. So now it's time for the Q and A's. Amy Seitz, did you want to talk any more about the USDA money? Yeah, do we want to move on to that? What I can share on that or what, what information is out there? On yeah, that? why don't you go ahead and do that while people are thinking of their questions for Laura? Yeah, so just in the last day or so, USDA came out with some additional information. So there's the nine and a half billion that we've all been talking about. USDA added some other funds to that uh, from the commodity credit something. So it's 19 billion for the food assistance program. 16 billion is supposed to go to farmers for actual losses. And then the breakdown of that further, 9.6 billion will go to cattle, dairy, and swine. 3.9 billion to row crops. 2.1 billion to specialty crops. 500 million to other crops. And in this other crops is everything else that isn't listed. So hemp, sheep, goats, horticulture, anything that's not in the other categories. So the calculations that they're looking at, and, and USDA has said that they'll come out with more rules soon, but how they're gonna be calculating it from January 1st to April 15th, they're going to want to see actual losses and the farmers will be covered 85% of the loss. And then from April 15th through the next two quarters, you can turn in expected losses and get covered 30% of the expected losses. But then it says that the commodity has to have experienced at least a 5% decrease in price. So one of the questions we've had is, is this a 5% decrease in the commodity market price that, that we've all been hearing about the price of cattle has dropped or is it a loss in income? So that's trying to get a clarification on if it's a the commodity price decrease or a loss of income. Uh, so USDA is expecting to begin sign up early May. So in the next couple of weeks, we should have how they're going to let people apply. And then they're expecting to get payments out end of May, early June. So this, for Alaska farmers, there's still a lot of questions on how, if, if our farmers up here will fit in here. Uh, and then there's there's $3 billion that's going to go to purchasing produce, dairy, and meat to send to food banks and other nonprofits serving Americans in need. This sounds like it's going to be more of a wholesaler and distributor companies purchasing the food, putting together boxes, and, and sending it out to these the food banks and, and other areas. So again, I'm not sure how much our Alaska farmers will be able to be included in that. Um, and then there's 873 million to purchase products for food banks. And they're looking for 
industry requests, food bank, you know, trying to get a feedback on what's needed there. And then 850 million for food banks to cover administrative costs and food purchases. And I think this is one area that might help our farmers. At least 600 million of this is supposed to go to food purchases. So I think this is where food banks will be able to purchase direct from farmers. So there's potential here, but until they come out with answering some of these questions more in the next couple of weeks, we'll have to see what our farmers will be able to get out of this. It's really interesting how 85% of the loss has to happen before April 15th, or that they'll pay 85% on losses up till April 15th, and then only 30% on losses. Be I mean, are they not realizing the next level well, effect, I guess? Yeah, and <laughs> I don't understand farm to table. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, you know, what happens if, like up here, we're expecting pretty much no tourism. We're expecting restaurants not to be open as normal. So what happens if we expect a pretty big loss and then something happens and we maybe don't have as big a loss? Are, we pen are you gonna be penalized if you bring in more money? Or what happens if it's a much bigger loss than you expected? Like if more restaurants shut down. Yeah. When you listed out the categories for the different um, chunks of industry, uh, are flowers included in the other or are they included in the specialty crops? They're a specialty crop, aren't they? Peonies are a specialty crop. They are, but in that previous slide of Laura's about specialty crops, it also listed livestock and livestock aren't a specialty crop by USDA. Well, definition. No, but I think the wording there was specialty crops and livestock. Okay. They weren't including livestock in the specialty crop. They were just saying it's okay. going to go to specialty crops and livestock, including. Okay. Got it. So what, and one of the questions that's come up, I don't, I don't know if I've heard anyone bring it up here, but some other states on the other crops, there was a question of uh, aquaculture would be covered under that. And there was another chunk of money to cover fish and aquaculture. So the USDA is trying to have aquaculture go to that other source of money. So this is for land farmers. Any indication of how these funds are gonna be dispersed? No, okay. Other, other than they're wanting to get it dis dispersed by the end of June uh, or end of May, early June. Should people be watching Division of Ag to be announcing something about applying for these funds? Or should it, you know, do you think it's gonna be an application directly to USDA or any guidance there? Um, it'll be through USDA. My understanding is it's gonna be through USDA, some, whether it's FSA or, but my understanding, they're, they're trying to keep it there at USDA. Okay. What I would say, if we learned anything from the SBA and the PPP and the IDL, get your information ready. Have it ready to go. Even if you just have the information from that PPP application that I shared with you guys, that's going to be a lot of the same essential information they're going to have. Or go get a sample FSA application now. Fill it out, have their information be ready to go. That way you can um, get ahead of the curve. The other thing I learned is eight o'clock at night, Alaska time, be submitting those applications online because it's midnight on the East Coast and they can't really tell the difference. Yeah, yeah, and the, the paperwork I think will be important for, for this amount of money also. Um, they're going to want something official some, or some, some way to verify the actual losses because this is going to be based on actual losses. But yeah, as soon as I know all of the groups who have been paying attention, as soon as there's any word on applications opened up, we'll all be trying to get that out as fast as possible. 
Laura, I don't want to um, contradict what you said, but and I and I maybe I won't name the credit union to not put them on the spot, but my credit union, um, it took them a while to get back to me with the application. When they did, um, you know, she said, get it turned into me as quickly as possible. And then like the next day, it we, they ran out of money. But she indicated to me that they were still going to accept applications and keep them in order of timestamp, date and timestamp received, should they receive more money they would start with those applications first. That's fantastic. I am working with a couple of bankers down here on this side of the peninsula that have basically said, we want nothing. Okay. Um, so good for you. Um, what credit union is that? Because it's obviously one that cares about Alaskans. You should throw them under the bus. I mean, that's why I meant. Matt Valley that, Federal Credit Union. Yeah. And I'm going to do a big plug for Northern Bank of all of my clients that I have helped um submit the ppps northern bank has killed themselves and they took a lot of people that were not their clients in the beginning until they were told by sba they couldn't do that anymore and they've been fantastic and one thing i would mention whether it's ppp eidl these funds were expecting even if you don't qualify at that point you know, fill out the paperwork because i know Murkowski's office and Sullivan's office, you know, we're all working to make sure these small scale farmers like we have up here, if they've been hurt, actually have something to help. So they're fighting like crazy. And I really think that's why Dunleavy is sitting on his little pool of money to decide what he needs to do with it to try and help all of us. And he's trying to get more. So that's also good. Anything else? Not seeing a lot of questions come through. You did a great job of, of covering everything. We had some questions in the chat box specific to farmers market guidance, but Brad and, and Heidi are handling that with the responses. Awesome. Do we not get Christina, did you have a question that we missed somehow? You are welcome to unmute yourself and ask it. Ah, I believe Christina was the one we were talking to in the beginning that had been applied for the PPP maybe and been turned down. All oh, right. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, yes. Yeah. Christina, you want to jump on and chat with me? Um. Which I remember her question was about, she had applied to the banks, and I know early on, especially, this was an issue for farmers everywhere, but she applied yeah. for the PPP and her bank turned her down because she was a farmer. Well, and I, I'm, I'm curious as to how she paid herself and if it wasn't just because it was a farmer, but it was because she was a sole proprietor that didn't have a profit on her Schedule C. Because if she's a sole proprietor and she didn't have a profit on her Schedule C, she's ineligible because she didn't have any income. So therefore, she technically didn't have any damages. There she is. There's Christina. Okay. Was that about me? I was in bad service, so it's cutting in and out. I'm not sure. That, that is. So um, you said no, you were. No, that's correct. <laughs> so I'll let my husband speak. I'm driving, so I'll let him talk. Perfect. Fill me in. Can you guys hear me all right? Absolutely. All right. So in the beginning, early on, we tried to fill out the EDL. We were told by the SBA, couldn't do that one. Agricultural. Mm -hmm people are exempt. Okay. We moved on to North Rim Bank and we did not have an account with them. Ours is Credit Union One. They tried to fill out the PPP loan um, and they couldn't because the application to fill out the application and the loan officer had to check a box that I wasn't an agricultural business or entity and that excluded us from finishing the application. 
at that point, I got in touch with the Dan Sullivan's office, and they apparently fixed it. But by the time we got notified, we weren't able to reconnect with Northrim before the money was gone. And that was just uh, about four or five days ago that we were told it was fixed by Elaine Spraker with okay. Dan Sullivan. So, yeah, that is a bummer, but your application is still there. Have you at least been able to email your banker or did he just stop you? No, he just called me and he tried to walk through the process on the phone and yeah, it, it, we Where couldn't complete the application. Yeah, we, we Where never are you got guys located. Kasilov. So I would say tomorrow, call my guy. Um, he is Northrim. He's the manager and he's trying, he's treading water. He's been working 18 hour days. I know cause I'm in rotary with him, but he will try and have your application there and ready if more money comes loose. Okay. I know he'll do the right thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe um, give that's him a call. He probably is. And he probably did have the, the, the applications literally were rolling out and changing daily. I had to apply for the EIDL three different times because they changed the process and the forms. So it is definitely an imperfect system. But if the reason they strictly turned you down was that ag question, but um, maybe I'm going to, um, I'm going to chat you my phone number and um, let you text me because I want to ferret out a couple of questions to make sure it's actually even worth your going through all of this um, pain to uh, long-term be profitable. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And we, we showed a profit last year. It's so. Well, I understand that, but um, just, yeah, give me a shout when this is all over and I'm going to ask you some private questions that you may not want to put out in the chat and okay. uh, we'll see what your eligible amount would have been. And then we'll go from there. All right, thanks. You bet. And then, I don't know, do I need to touch on unemployment for any of you guys? Would you like to hear how that can affect you as a sole proprietor? Yes. Okay. Um, so the way the unemployment is set up, if you are a sole proprietor, um, which means you're self-employed or you are going to automatically, even though it says you're going to be denied. You apply for the unemployment and you will get that base $600 a week. They are going to want proof of that self-employment. So that's going to be either a 1099 from last year or it's going to be your Schedule C from your taxes. And even if it doesn't show a profit on that Schedule C, it still shows that you are employed and that you're self-employed. And that will make you eligible for that $600 per week. You have to file weekly. It's going to ask you if you are able to take work. You have to say yes, that you would be willing to give up whatever you're doing um, to go take a job. But then when it asks, did you look for a job? The answer is no, COVID, we're not allowed. We're on a mandated shutdown right now. And so you are able to say no to that. And so a lot of the sole proprietors that would have taken that PPP, like I personally, I'll just share my info. I would have been eligible for $3,800 over the course of this COVID mess um, based on my PL last year. I don't want $3,800. I'm going to take the unemployment because I can't work right now. And that's going to help me more and give me more money to put back into our economy um, right here locally. So you go to your My Alaska, you're going to file the UI, and then you need to email them. And again, I'll add to the resources link that I shared with you guys, the email address for support at the unemployment office. But you have to email them that Schedule C or that 1099 to prove you were employed and had an income. That's how they're, they're testing self-employment. Secondarily, there are some other programs that you may potentially be eligible for and they're going to take the application that they get from you and they're going to put that out there based on what your schedule c shows so um get them the information call them to get them to do the self-employment application because it's not up on their website yet they had meant to have it up there today that was their goal it didn't happen it will be there 
but um, that's that's what's going to save a lot of the small sole proprietors is that unemployment insurance. But if you didn't have, again, proof that you were self-employed, you can't just go get six hundred dollars a week. You have to be able to prove that you had a viable income. Does that make sense? Yes. So Nicole just threw up questions from the Google Doc earlier, which was, we 1099 are short-term farm labor. If you 1099 them, they are not, you're not eligible for the PPP. It's that simple. Um, it would be really nice if it was. Technically, they're supposed to be eligible to go apply for the PPP themselves. Um, Long-term based on, unless they were making $100,000 a year, they're better off going and applying for unemployment, which is just goes against everything in me, but that, that's the reality. And um, for those of us that are thinking, I don't want to get that assistance, remember that every dime that we take here in this community is money we're spending to save our community. And that's why I am absolutely gonna go get every dime that I can. Yeah, hi, this is Wayne. I just uh, filed Patty's uh, unemployment. I have unemployment from teaching, being a substitute yeah. teacher, I'm employed that way. Her, uh, she's, you know, doing the farming, uh, we claim, claim her on the farming side. Do I, I, since I just filed it, I just have to send in a ten, uh, uh, Schedule C? Yes, you need to send them that Schedule C. And um, you're going to have to, you're going to get a letter that says you're declined because their automatic computer system, we don't meet their criteria in their automatic computer system, but they are, they've gotten over 35,000 applications in the last week and a half. And they're manually going through every single declination to make sure, see if it's COVID related. And then they're reaching out personally to get the information from each person. But as that's happening, the people that call, are the people that they're grabbing first because we're being proactive. So give them a call tomorrow to do the application on the phone. When you call the number, they're not gonna let you through and they're gonna hang up on you because they won't let you hold because the hold time's too long, but they are categorizing that call log and they are working backwards. I got a call at six o'clock at night to talk about mine. So they're, they're working like crazy to do it and just, you know, be patient, be kind. They're here to help. Um, and that's, I think, my biggest message to everyone. Yes, the system is incredibly flawed. Be patient, be kind. Everybody's doing the best they can, and um, we all want this to come back together. Yeah, I was talking to them last week online, and they found out I had worked as an employment officer years ago, and they offered me a job. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I'm surprised nobody's to, offered me one yet. <laughs> I'd have to move to Anchorage to do it, though. <laughs> oh, there you go. You're off the hook. <laughs> Well, I asked my guy an interesting thing. I am a consultant. I don't actually work for W-2 wages, but none of my uh, clients can afford to pay me right now. And so I said, if they can't afford to pay me and there's no job to give me, but I choose to volunteer for them to keep them in business, does that make me ineligible? And the guy said, no, there's no job there. Go for that. I like that plan. So that's what I'm doing. Laura, did you want to go through some of those other questions from before? Um, I can't help questions two or three. Okay. Um, but let me see what Greg Eiler has. I have a question about the state travel mandate, if it's okay. Oh. I don't think you'd be able to get away with that exception, Gregory. The oil industry is having to... Um, quarantine everyone. And I think if we're making them do it, they're going to make you do it too. Which I, I think um, the mandate for bringing in workers for essential labor, I think that's supposed to be reviewed by April 20, well, by tomorrow, I guess. Um, so if you're not expecting workers to come up wait and see what the next mandate's gonna be on what they're gonna require. This is true. Oh, so I, um, let me, everyone, I'm gonna repost my link. This is a link to a Google Doc. If you guys grab it, you should be able to open it up. 
And that every resource listed is a hyperlink that should lead you to the data that I'm referring to. Does somebody want to try and open that for me so I know it works for you? Yeah. It works, awesome, thanks Allison. So there's some great information there. Any other questions? Yeah, folks, if, if you've got more questions, feel free to ask them now. We've got, you know, a great resource in the room and <laughs> we, we're scheduled to let go another half hour, but we won't keep people if we don't have additional questions because we've all probably got lawns we could rake or dogs we could pet or other things that we could do with our evening, right? Right. I have a question. Yep, go ahead, Christy. So a situation I have is that I have paid a contractor some money to do construction projects on my farm and I'm boarding horses. And I have boarders who are giving me notice they're leaving. And I also have a rental business, which my tenant has also given me notice they're moving out because of COVID stuff. So my concern really is, is there a loan situation for things like that? It's a mix. I'm sitting here with a mix of stuff. And I thought, even if I had to pay low interest, I'm okay with taking a loan to complete the construction project, which will benefit my business ultimately and provide some work for others. So where's that fall? So that can fall under the idle because you are boarding horses, you aren't raising them. Um, so it's a business. The rental income also falls under the idle. Um, and it may boil down to you have to go to your bank for a personal loan. Hopefully there are more funds in the idle and it'll fit. The other thing that'll happen though, um, again, that part of that CARES Act where you could get that $10,000 credit for um, hiring people if you didn't get the PPP. There's also a huge credit on your taxes for um, completing capital improvement projects during this COVID time and in the three months subsequent to it. So now's a great time to invest in that capital improvement project and it will have the biggest impact on your taxes. But your tax man's gonna be the one that really has to delve into that and help you. Now's a great time to have a really good relationship with your accountant. Yes. There was another question there, um, Laura, about- oh, yeah. who I yeah, contact? For the- um, so Bear with me while I go to my Facebook and steal the uh, address. So you guys keep talking and I'm gonna go find that. The second part of the question is mandate against childcare affecting prospects for working this season. That isn't me. And yes, Patty, we are recording the presentation. And I think, I think you'll get an email link via Zoom. Is that right, Jody, for the recording if you want to watch it again? Yep, once, once I get it back from Zoom, then I, I also have all of the chat that's recorded. So I'll just go through it if there's any, you know, um, edits or anything that need to happen through the chat and then just uh, send everything to everyone at the same time. And I just went and added that um, info into our that little resources slide. It doesn't look as pretty as the original, um, but it'll work. And it just basically tells you that you're going to go to your My Alaska, and then it tells you where to send that information, the doi.uis. Hi, this is Nicole. Um, I just wanted, since we were mentioning the chat box being recorded for people. Uh, the very first in, uh, addition into the chat box is another link. This came out last week by the Farmers Legal Action Group, uh, specifically about COVID and farmers. And uh, it's great. It's better than the one that Michael Kilpatrick and Growing Farmers put out. It's really detailed. Um, 
topics more current. And uh, I highly recommend going there and checking that out for any questions, um, you know, just as a reference, just to, to keep going back to it. it's a good one. Um, uh, the links in the chat box. The other thing I'm also going to say is if you are, and I should have said this in the beginning, if you are listening to this webinar, I don't know, say a week to two weeks from now, um, today's April 20th, verify everything that I have had to say because they are changing the program so quickly that I may, this could all be irrelevant, wrong information. So do your fact checking, go to the resources that I listed out there and check. Those will be updated and stay current. And the SBA website really is a good one as well. I have a question. I'm not sure who can answer it though. Yep, go ahead. Okay, so it's about the USDA programs that are forthcoming, the 19 billion that the president's talking about, Sonny Purdue. I know you guys covered that some, but my question was, I've, I've done some reaching out to an RCS and FSA both, and we don't, we don't have a, that I know of, a USDA office in our area so who will be facilitating those programs? Will we need to get in touch with an out of state or like an Anchorage office or? What area are you in? Yosilov. Excellent. Which that would go through the Palmer FSA office. I spoke to Erin today and she said no. No? She no idea. Yeah, she said she had no idea. Nothing's come to her. I asked, well, who do I reach out to, NRCS? Because if you look up USDA for down here, it refers you to NRCS. And Josh spoke to NRCS, and nobody knows. <laughs> so a little confusing. Well, yeah, and, and in the next couple of weeks, because the USDA did say they want to be able to start taking information early May. So in the next 10 days, we should, we should have those answers. Yes. And when the PP and I will say when the PPP first came out, I immediately called our banker because I knew he was an SBA guy. And he's like, I don't know anything about it. And I said, well, it's coming. I need to be at the top of your list. Right. It was seven days before he actually had the ability to do anything with that. I knew it before he did. So just stay ready and be, you got to be present and paying attention and the early bird gets the worm for sure. And we, we should have said at the beginning um, that that we're giving Laura some grace here in that um, she's not a lawyer, she's not your tax person, and everything she said here should be verified with your tax accountant. And like she said, what the first uh, the first webinar that I was on about PPP, the next day I was on another one and it had changed already, right? The interest rate on the loan had changed and, and things will continue to change. And if they give more money to the program, there'll probably be more changes. So do your due diligence. Like I said, it's a really good time to have a good relationship with your accountant um, and your small business or your SBDC office, um, et cetera. But, Brad, I see that you're there, and I was wondering if you could um, chat at all about farmers markets or um, in addition to the reference point that Heidi put in about um, COVID resources for farmers markets. I didn't know if you wanted to add any to this about um, the farmers market world while we've got, while we've got captive audience. Uh, I would say similar uh, that uh, Laura was saying that it's just changing so quickly that uh, just to stay tuned and pay attention to what's happening at your market. Uh, I just get, was reading in the chat how the downtown Anchorage market is gonna allow all sorts of uh, types of vendors. This is something that we're still working on. The Alaska Farmers Market Association is working closely with DEC to, to make sure that our markets stay open all summer and that we can create social distancing. But um, yeah, uh, stay tuned I think is, is the name of the game right now. I'm gonna put on my grant writing suggestion hat for a second and be ready, especially those markets, for some advertising dollars that's gonna be coming out there for you guys to help market yourself. That will bear it out. I think where we had the big push with all that Alaska grown money 10 years ago, it'll probably roll out again. So be ready for that and be watching for it. Awesome. 
this, Nicole, again, regarding the um, questions about farmers markets, there's the webinar on Friday. Brad, would you mind speaking to that and directing everybody towards that? Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Yeah, so on Friday, we are having a joint DC uh, Alaska Farmers Market Association Food Policy Council uh, education for farmers market vendors, managers, and staff about the DEC guidelines or recommendations right now for markets and um, for resources on everybody who's about to get going here in the next few weeks. So yeah, uh, it starts at, I wanna say nine, what the time is it start, four o'clock? No. 9.30. That's what I was first, <laughs> came out with my first inkling, that's what it is. 9.30, so, yeah, not four in the afternoon, but 9.30 in the morning. Yes. <laughs> No, 9.30 in the morning. It's going to be great. We're going to have representatives from D.C. there. And um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of information for folks. Another free webinar that's that's being offered, but you do need to register. It's, go to alaskafarmersmarkets.org. Click on, I think it, they're all listed under events. And then the, the registration information is there. Exactly, under events. And if I remember correctly, uh, the D.C. will be there to ask, to, you know, help to facilitate the discussion about how to be safe, but also I think some consideration as to different layouts that farmers markets can choose will also be among the topics. And different models, different markets around the country are using. So like learn, learning you know, from what people down in lower 48 have had to learn the hard way, we can just <laughs> pick up the best stuff that they got. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Megan's adding the links right there in the chat box if you guys weren't weren't watching she's so much quicker with her click back and forth than than some of us good job megan thank you <laughs> i'll add that to the resource slide as well too thank you so yeah i think laura that was a great point that you said about having all of your paperwork ready and all of your um things that uh could help you you know, prove that you're a business, that you've been in business. I mean, from your business license to us as a nonprofit, we have to have a resolution from our board of directors, you know, approving us to apply for the funds. So just, it, it's a good idea to go to the SBA, get your hands on the existing loan application. It may change, but it, it, you'd, be, um, you'd be more prepared. And as far as um, USDA, FSA, and Palmer, Aaron Sturdivant, not knowing anything yet, I think that that was also a good piece of advice, Laura, that it probably just hasn't hit her desk yet, but she likely will be who folks would go through um, to, to access the money. But, but um, you know, I want to give mad props to, to Brad from the Farmers Market Association and Jody from the Experiment Farm and Amy from Farm Bureau that, you know, that you have a group of people here, a group of resources that are trying to stay ahead of this on your behalf, gather the information and share the information as much as possible. So um, stay tuned, watch your email because I'm sure if more relevant information comes down, we'd be happy to have another webinar and talk, talk things through with folks. With that, I'm not seeing any more questions, Laura. So um, does anybody see a reason why we shouldn't wrap it up? I just wanna say thank you all so much for having me and, um, oops, wait. One more question. <laughs> hmm. That's a good question, Greg, and I we do not have the answer. But um, document, document, document. At the very least, we're all going to have so many write-offs at the end of this year, it may carry us into the next five. Um, I know that's a doom and gloom solution, but um, hold on to it. And thank you all, and thank you all for what you do, because if it weren't for farmers, we would not be able to have the security that we have. Um, I uh, work with Diamond M Ranch Resort really closely, and we do a lot of educating farm to table, and it's super important. So thank you all, and uh, stay strong. We'll get through this together. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, I just wanted to point out one more resource I added to the mute box, uh, the mute box, the check box, <laughs> chat box. Uh, it, for those people that um, are interested in creating uh, a bit of a plan for in case you or your farm crew do get sick or, or, or you have deliveries on the farm, there's a real quick little three pager. 
produced by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, it has really good ideas in there for how to like wrap that up so that you can um, think about those things as you're going along and document things and just have your plan in order. I highly recommend clicking that link I just put up there. It's quick. Thanks, Nicole. All right, now, now we'll wave goodbye. <laughs> Have a good evening, guys. Bye now. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Thanks Bye, so much. Guys. Thanks, Laura. You're rad. You're awesome. Thanks so much, Laura. I really appreciate it. Glad it worked out. Talk to you later. Yeah, Bye. absolutely. I really appreciate it. And